What I would like to talk to you about tonight is, is the issue of becoming a prophetic community. And I say a prophetic community in light of having revelation about what God wants to do that leads to a strategy of accomplishing it. Becoming a, a revelatory or a prophetic seer community. And so, um, Paul tells the church in Thessalonica, in 1 Corinthians 5, yeah, Paul, that same guy. <laughs> tells the church in Thessalonica not to, not to despise prophecy. And it wasn't because they were not despising prophecy. It was because they were despising prophecy. And I believe we're in a similar era today. If you, when I go to churches and, and I talk to, talk to pastors, many of the pastors say to me, well, John Paul, if, if we could have you, then I would, we wouldn't have a problem. And I said, but the problem is you, you didn't have me when I was young. Because if you would have, you would have said the same thing about me that you're saying about them. You see, I was asked to leave churches. I, I remember sitting on a bed and my wife crying saying, are you gonna get us kicked out of this church too? <laughs> yes, you were crying. <laughs> and don't forget it. I remember because I felt so bad that she was right. I believe the Lord began to deal with me about those issues. And, he, and out of that came the 101 course that we have and, and the 103, the issue of, of strongholds, the issue of how to, what's going to keep you from reaching your destiny and then how to get to your destiny. The idea of, of a deeper level of, of obedience called submission and how that operates in your life and how it'll operate with God. The idea of, of how you do in your job depicts how you would do in your ministry. So I have many young men and women who come to me and say, I want to go into the ministry. And I say, well, tell me about your job. Give me a history, your job history, because it will tell me what your ministry history will be. Because how you handle your job is how you'll handle your ministry. Because at the first, it's going to be very fresh, exciting, innovative, invigorating. Everybody's going to think you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. And then as time goes along, you're going to realize that you have to get up in the morning and you have to study, and you have to understand things of Scripture, and you have to look at the world in a, in a, in a way that is not like, well, if I show up for work, I can, or if I can slough off, I, I will. If you do that in your ministry, you'll starve. And so I begin writing courses to try to help people overcome those issues and, and to help people, not people who think they're going to be in the full-time ministry necessarily, although it will help that, but I begin to write courses that would help people live a life that would be productive in their church and advance the kingdom of the Lord Jesus. And what I've, I've come to see over the years is that in the process of doing this, there's, there's some issues. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about those issues uh, tonight. First thing is, let's take a look at what's happening in the prophetic world today. And these are the basic issues that we're now having to overcome. For example, we're having to fight prophetic history. What do I mean by fight prophetic history? I'll talk more about this in a minute, but basically the history that pastors have that says, I, won't, I don't ever want this again. Why do they feel that way? It's not that they don't believe in it. Why do they feel that way? The second one is understanding prophetic models, the various prophetic models that we have and the differences that they have and what they ex exude and, and, and exemplify to others who watch these type of, of prophetic demonstrations go on. Maturity versus gifting, understanding that there's a difference between how mature you are and how gifted you are. The fourth one is the changing church methodology, and we're going through an incredibly rapid change of pace today in, in understanding uh, and what, what is going on in the church and the methodologies that are being used and what the titles or types of methodologies uh, are. And then the final one is where do we go from here? How do we handle that? So I'm going to be covering these five issues tonight. 
and hopefully making some sense that will help you get kind of a broad grip on what you need to do as a seer or as a prophetic type of individual, a revelatory gifted type of individual, how to prosper in your churches, how to advance the kingdom, how to have peace with your pastor, and how to have a loving wife and family relationship and hear from God all at the same time. That's difficult to do in a short period of time, but I'll talk very, very fast, okay? Okay, let's start with the current prophetic history. Current prophetic histories. What we're dealing with is, is this. We're dealing with pastors who have heard inaccurate words depicted as if they were accurate. And change. For example, you tell the pastor, give your pastor a prophetic word, and then something comes along that's kind of similar to the prophetic word, but not really it. And you modify your prophetic word and say, that's what I told you was going to happen. And the pastor goes, you didn't tell me that was going to happen. Or, and if he doesn't say that to your face, he walks away thinking it. And if you press the issue and he pulled out a tape recorder, says, here, listen to your word. And you find out it wasn't what you prophesied. Somehow in our, 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 our memory becomes selective. We have selective memory. And pastors have to deal with that. And they have to deal with the issues where, where one moment a person comes in and says, God told me to tell you this is what you have to do. Five minutes later, another person comes in, I had a dream last night and God told me to tell you this is what you have to do. And they're opposite. And pastors have to live in that tension. After planting, planting five churches and pastoring and then being assistant pastors in various churches, I've come to realize that I've been my own worst enemy. And then I have people who are just like me. <laughs> it's like deja vu all over again, as Yogi Berra said. I, I, they walk into my office, they talk to me, and I, hear, I said, I said those exact words 30 years ago. So the pastors have to work through those inaccuracies and errant words that we try to make look good. Talk to a young, several big young men. The one young man in particular, I talked to him and I asked him, how accurate are you? He says, well, I haven't missed a thing. And I'm confused because his pastor says he gets like one out of 10 correct. I'm having breakfast with him to decide does he really have a gift or not? Because the pastor wants to kick him out of the church. I said, well, just give me, just give me something that's come true lately. And he says, well, I don't really have anything that's come true lately, but I've got some prophecies that God gave me about the year 2010. And I said, well, that's too bad. He goes, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, by definition, prophecy is you tell something in the future that comes to pass. So you don't get any recognition to 2010. And you can't demand that they give you recognition today on tomorrow's anointing. And he says, well, God doesn't give me anything like that. I said, well, does that tell you anything? <laughs> Either God ran out of revelation or he can't trust you with the revelation that you have or he has. And so then we have other issues that cause pastors to kind of scratch their head and wonder. Egocentric behavior, where you're always wanting the attention. In our insecurity, we tend to want attention because attention tells us, yes, not only do we think we're gifted, they think we're gifted. And if they think we're gifted, we have security. And if we have security, we won't be rejected. And therefore, I have to focus the attention on me. We equate that to secure, to security. Weak character issues where weakness in our marriages, weaknesses with our children, weaknesses in our finances, weakness in telling the truth. We say there's an angel, there's no angel. We say that God visited you and God didn't visit you. You may have had, felt the presence of the Lord, but you, you extrapolate out of that kind of warm, fuzzy feeling that God's in the place that God stood before you. And that's what you tell people. Weak character. Failure to differentiate between maturity and immaturity, not only in our gifting, but in, in our character. 
I was raised in a denomination that was started by incredibly prophetic people that presidents of the United States would go to to, to, to hear the secrets of what the enemy was doing in World War II. Today, that very denomination is writing position papers saying prophetic and apostolic ministry does not exist. Now, how do you go from being started by that kind of revelation to coming to a place where you, you say it doesn't exist? I believe it's because men, we have not been taught that we differentiate between character and gift. And when they can't make that differentiation and they say, incredibly flawed individuals that have a gift that sporadically works, they can't equate the two to the prophets who were holy and were, were so mature that everybody, whatever they said came true, like Samuel. They, and so they say, well, then they missed it. They're ungodly. And not only are they ungodly, look at their character. And then they, they, they start developing a theology that says it, it doesn't exist anymore because we don't see it. They fail to understand that character sets the ceiling on your gift and that the weaker your character, the lower your gift. Doesn't mean that you'll always be that way because with greater character, greater gift begins to manifest. Then we have this issue of needing to be platform oriented, meaning if we have a word, we have to stand up in front of the church and we have to be the one that gives that word to the people, failing to recognize that in, the, in scripture, the prophetic voice hardly ever addressed the nation. He told the king, and the king addressed the nation. Why is that? Because the king has been given a responsibility to lead the people. The prophetic person has been given a responsibility to hear from God and deliver it to the leader. And anytime we violate those type of things, leaders do not particularly think fondly of that because they know we breached spiritual protocols. And then we wonder why we're not getting any more great revelation. And this reason is because God can't trust us to follow the protocols. There are heavenly protocols that must be followed. There's heavenly protocols in the throne room and there's heavenly protocols here. And I guarantee you, there is no protocol breached in the throne room. And you've, the angels and every spiritual being there follows those protocols. And we think we don't have to here. And the reality is, as long as you think you don't have to, you'll be very limited in the amount of God's presence that is here. And I'm not talking, last night wasn't a breach of protocol. If it was, then, the, then wisdom, as we said in uh, Proverbs chapter 8, then wisdom breached protocol by hilariously laughing with the Lord as he created everything. Last night was not a breach of protocol. It was in line with tickle time. And every good father knows the value of tickle time. <laughs> and this, that was happening last night. We had a little tickle time last night and uh, whew, it was good. <laughs> another, another issue in, in prophetic history that we're looking at is weak theology. Somehow we think that we prophetic people were born understanding spiritual matter and that that spiritual matter is perfectly in line with the Bible. And then when we give it, we wonder why we're called a heretic. And the reason why we wonder is because we don't know the scripture. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you a little secret. Bob's not here. Bob Jones isn't here. You obviously know that. Bob Jones didn't get past the eighth grade. Bob Jones was a drill sergeant in the, I think, Army? Marines. Marines. In the Marines in the Marines. Bob Jones, people listen to Bob talk and they think he's not very bright. Bob is brilliant. With very few exceptions, Bob Jones can quote more scripture to you and give you the chapter and the verse than 95% of the people in this room. He knows the Word of God. We take outward demeanor and we interpret or we extrapolate out of this outward demeanor a lack of need to study the Scripture, thinking, well, look at Bob Jones. He's a seer, has all these type of things happen to him. He knows nothing about the Scripture. You have not spent time with Bob Jones. This man knows Scripture and he has memorized it, and he knows exactly how to apply it. 
Weak theology. It will hinder your gift. Delusions of grandeur. Delusions of grandeur. When you're as old as I am, you remember a, a decade or so ago when a nationally known minister fell, and right before he fell, he stood up on, on national and international TV and he implored people to give to his particular ministry because he is the only one that God has anointed to reach South America. That's delusions of grandeur. There is no only one but Jesus. And if you don't do it, God will get somebody else. He'll get 20 other. Elijah thought he was the only one. And God says, Poof. 7,000 more who haven't bowed their knee. You're not the only one. And neither was he. But we have those type of delusions of grandeur that stand up and we, we tell our pastor when we're having difficulty putting two nickels together, we tell our pastor that we're going to be standing before kings. And we expect him to trust us more. Then, there's, then we go on from there and then authority issues. We prophetic people tend to be the, the personalities that have been hurt the most by authority and therefore we have the greatest of, uh, authority aversion techniques that you can find. And the only time we don't avoid authority is when we have it. <laughs> and then we could really rule with an iron fist. We see authority as somebody who can hurt us. And we automatically assume that they intend to hurt us. And according to the law, what you focus on, you make room for, that is exactly what you get. You'll get hurt because you will, when you focus on something, you will tend to do that which causes pain to come. We also have historically had a, a tendency to yield to pressure to perform. Almost like a performance on demand mentality. And some, some schools have even taught kind of like that. You should be able to prophesy to every single person in this room. And that, that leads to a performance on demand. And performance on demand all, only does one thing. It lessens the quality of prophetic utterance that is given. It dilutes it. I think it's far higher to give a fewer high quality prophetic words that change people's lives, change people's future. And as government officials see that and as pastors see that, you start seeing a higher level of degree of trust in pastors toward the prophet. I've had some very strange things happen to me. And I've had pastor after pastor say to me, John Paul, if anybody else was telling me this, I would ask them to leave before they finished the story. But because you're telling me this, I believe it. I believe it. How do you get to that point where the pastors believe you when you tell them the unbelievable? Well, you start you go through a lot of pain first, and then you learn what caused you that pain, and then you stop doing the things that caused you that pain. Another thing that kills prophetic ministry is uh, announcing their opinion as if it was revelation. And here's how you do that. You get this one prophetic word, and it says, and uh, there shall be a move of God uh, in um, Boston. May it be so, God. There'll be a move of God in Boston. Your opinion is, is that it will happen in your church in Boston. But God never said that. But surely, this is where it's going to happen. This is where he told me to go to church and a revival wouldn't happen if I wasn't there. <laughs> Delusions of grandeur, egocentric behavior. 
So it has to be this church. So we have this mental juggling that we do that allows us to say something with great conviction, but we just change revelation into opinion. And that causes churches to discard us. One of the greatest battles that goes on that I've, I've noticed is that there's insecurity in pastors and there's the rejection in prophets. And when insecurity and rejection come together, there will be a chemical reaction. <laughs> because your rejection will cause you to do things that push his insecurity button. And his insecurity button will do things, or her insecurity button will do things to push your rejection button. And then about two years later, it comes to a head and something has to give, and it's usually you. And so what I've noticed is that there's a two-year life cycle in the young prophetic ministries in the church. They rotate in and they rotate out because it takes about two years to go through all the stuff you create and then you leave or are asked to leave and then you redo everything you just did in the next church you go to and you wonder why do they keep doing this to me? And they're not doing this to you at all. It just takes you two years to recreate what you just did in the previous church. You are doing this to you. I think another thing that's hurt prophetic and revelatory ministry, I think it's actually hurt all the Ephesians 4 ministries, is that I believe we have lowered the standards of a prophetic voice in order to achieve or receive broader acceptance of the prophetic. Hoping that more people will believe there are prophetic voices. I believe we've lowered the standards so that anybody who has a word of knowledge is a prophet. And I believe that's hurt us. In wanting to be accepted, I think we have actually caused less acceptance. So that when you lower the standard and this person is seen as a prophetic voice here, and who's immature, and this person is seen as a prophetic voice here, who's very immature, and how do you, how do you bridge the gap here? And so what happens is people who don't know the mature prophetic voice and see daily the immature prophetic voice think the mature voice must be just like this one. And so they lump everything together, the immature and the mature into the immature stereotype. And that hurts. What I believe we have to do is raise the standard of prophetic ministry Fewer get over that bar, and then you can easily tell who has made it and who has not. And so what we have is, we, and it's already started. It started not only in prophetic, it started in apostolic. And so what we have is, we have the immature, I'm prophetic. And the slightly, a little more mature, um, descriptive adjective, I'm, um, I'm an imminent prophet. And then the little more mature that prophetic voices, well, I, I'm an apostolic prophet. And the little bit more mature says, I am an intergalactic prophet. <laughs> and what we end up having is a series of descriptive adjectives that are trying to depict levels of maturity. And I don't think you need that if you raise the bar. And I tell you today, people ask me, they try to tell me what I am, and I tell I'm not. I, I, was, I was at a, a, a national leader, charismatic leaders, where 70 leaders across the United States were asked to come in to this, to this uh, meeting that was being held in Orlando, Florida, put on by Charisma Magazine. They asked me to come in, along with all 69 other guys, and to talk about uh, the, the, the problem in the charismatic community of a lack of, of accountability and a lack of morality and what do we do when we see these things happening, etc. And one of the topics that we were talking on was, was prophetic ministry and the, the topic came up of do we call ourselves prophets or not? And so I was up there on this panel and some of the panel was saying, absolutely we do. And I said, and I said no, we don't. 
I said, even Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And what I found out is that when I have to tell people I'm a prophet, they don't believe me. And if they tell you who you are, you can't convince them you're not. <laughs> See, it's what the people, what God puts into their heart that they believe you are. What your gift displays to them will tell them what God has done in you. And so it's a two-way street. God puts it into them to give to you. God puts it into you and you display it to them. And it becomes evident, it becomes self-evident that this is who and this is what you are. And I tell people, I said, I told them there, I said, I am not a prophet. And they said, oh, yes, you are. You just don't call yourself one. I said, no, I am not. Because I have seen where prophetic ministry is going. And we have to raise the standard to that level, not lower it to ours. Read Acts 2. That'll tell you where it's going. We're not there. I'm a guy who has a revelatory gift that periodically works. It doesn't work near as much as people think it does, and sometimes it works better than they wish it did. <laughs> and so all of these things that I've just talked to you about, that these basically cause denominations, cause movements to reject prophetic ministry. There's other issues but I'm, that are their issues, but I'm not talking about their issues. I, I really believe that until we correct our issues, we have no right to demand they correct their issues. You know, take, this, this, take the log out of our eye before they demand, we demand they take the splinter out of theirs. Well, then we come in and we find out there's changing prophetic models. There's, there's these two types of prophetic models that are going on. We need to understand them. And then out of them flows a whole bunch of other types of prophetic models. I, uh, Bill Hammond says it like this. There's, there's two types of prophetic models. There's the, there's the Nabi type of prophetic model. And that, that type of prophetic model simply means that word Nabi is a Hebrew word that means to bubble up, to gush forth, to, to basically speak without restraint. Whatever comes out of your mouth is going to be God speaking through you as the Holy Spirit gives you that download. And I think there is some merit to that if the Holy Spirit's given you the download. And so that's, that's one description. He says that the other description, he calls it the ecstatic prophets. The ecstatic prophets. That's basically the, the idea of ecstatic prophet means you are participating in the vision or the event. Angelic visitation, translation, taken to heaven, taken to another geographic location, taken to the future, taken to the past, look into what is coming tomorrow, you're participating. Daniel was an ecstatic prophet. Ezekiel was an ecstatic prophet. Elijah was an ecstatic prophet. Elisha was an ecstatic prophet. All those encounters that went on and the, the ecstasy that came upon them and the strange events that took place, the Ezekiels who are levitate, levitated. People say, boy, you need to use a different word than that. Okay, picked up off the ground. <laughs> picked up off the ground in front of the elders of Israel He's picked up between heaven and earth as if by the hair of his head and he's slowly turning like this and then he's taken away from them in, in a vision. Now if that happened right here tonight, some of you would freak out. <laughs> and others of you would try to grab my feet as I went. And so what happens in the ecstatic realm, do you have these encounters that are extraneous to you? You have the outside coming to you and you enter into their world versus, and they enter into your world versus a bubbling over sensation. It's, a, it's one built on dreams, it's, a, it's built on visions, it's built, built on visitations and trances and strange things happening. And there's not a whole lot of people like that. There's getting to be more, but as Aaron said, when you, when you walk into streams, the spiritual warfare definitely takes a dramatic leap. And everybody who moves there is shocked at that reality. And it doesn't make a difference whether you're a secretary or an intern. 
It doesn't make a difference whether you're working in shipping or whether you're writing books. The spiritual warfare at streams is heavy duty. Here's why. Whenever you, to the level of your anointing, the sphere, the gift of the sphere of your anointing, and that sphere can increase, it can decrease. Daniel's increased and then it decreased. It increased with some kings and then disappeared and then other kings didn't even know he existed and then God brought it back. So the sphere of influence can increase and can decrease as Daniel's did. And what happens is some of us don't recognize that that, that takes place that the sphere increases and the sphere decreases. We think God's mad at us or something like that. And the reality is he's not. You see, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little secret here, and I, I hope this isn't too much of a rabbit trail. Some of us need to understand what Paul says about marriage and about the issue of sex and marriage. Because that is the issue. Because Paul says, and I, yet I speak not concerning a husband and a wife. I speak concerning Christ and the church. And here's what you need to understand. There are times when a husband and wife are intimate. There are times when the husband withdraws from the wife during her monthly cycle and there's a cleansing that goes on. And it's not rejection and it's not evil. And just like that, we go through a cleansing process in our lives and the Lord backs off from us. It's nothing bad. And then as God, as, our, as we get cleansed and as we go through, through uh, the process of all that, then what ends up happening is the Lord comes right back to us at a time when we are most reproductive. And what I'm sensing is happening is we were close to ovulating. See, if you understand the ways of God, then things become so much clearer and so much easier in your life. You don't, you don't, the enemy can't, the knowledge of the scripture keeps the enemy from pummeling you and ripping you off and tossing you by every wind of doctrine. We have to understand the ways of God. This ecstatic realm is, is, is a stunning realm to be in. Well, as, as the anointing, to get back on track, as the anointing begins to increase in your life and your sphere of authority begins to increase, now all of a sudden, the spiritual entities over the area where you're at, if you have an anointing for your church, <clears throat> then only the spiritual entities that are sent by the enemy to destroy your church know you're there. The bigger ones over your city don't pay attention to the little guys until they're no longer little. And then as your sphere of authority increases, and now you not only have influence in your church, you have influence in your city. Now all of a sudden, the city's spiritual entities know you're there, and they now jump in to the melee. And then as your sphere of authority increases, and now you have influence in your state or your region, now you have a whole group of spiritual entities that know you're there, and they now jump into the melee. And as it continues to grow, if you have authority internationally, then now you have demonic forces in other nations that jump into the melee. And that's why when people come to streams, they are shocked at the spiritual warfare, the intensity of everything that goes on there day in and day out, 24 hours a day, 365 days a week. The demons don't know it's Christmas. And sometimes we think they even work harder on Christmas. So we have to understand the dynamics of what goes on and with an increased anointing, what that means literally in the heavenlies over you. And I'm not gonna talk about, uh, my book, Needless Casualties of War Speaks for Itself. At some point we'll probably do a spiritual warfare conference and go into greater detail than even what's in that book because I've learned even more since I wrote the book. And it will help you really understand how to process. You see, once you have been up into the throne room and you have seen all the stuff that's going on, you start to understand how this works and what is being said in Scripture and why it was said that way and how we can then sometimes twist things. And I have some wonderful friends in, in, this, this, uh, in other movements that embrace a whole different type of, of warfare. And I, and I think there's still men and women of God, but I disagree with them. 
And, and I have a very sound biblical reason for that. But I don't have time to go into that. And I'm not, that's not the topic of this particular, particular evening. What we have to begin to understand is, is that with, with these two types of prophetic models, both of them have a maturity process that they have to go through. And that maturity process, those of you taking the 101 know this maturity continuum, how in Acts chapter 2, Joel chapter 2, there's the call, there's the train, there's the commission, there's sons and daughters, young men, old men, my servants. And how when you start out, everybody from the day that you're saved can prophesy. Why do I know that? Because once Jesus enters into your heart, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So guess what can happen the moment he enters into your heart? The spirit of prophecy comes on you and what do you want to do? You should want to prophesy. And if you don't, it's because you're keeping it back because you think, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. And then as he grows inside of you and the more you're able to distinguish soul from spirit, then what happens is you begin to get more accurate prophecies. Because at the beginning, there's a lot of soul in that little bit of word. And as you grow, there's much more spirit and less soul. And then all spirit, and also when it becomes all spirit and no soul influencing the word, not no soul meaning you don't have a soul, no soul influencing the word, then like Samuel, he lets none of your words fall to the ground and become void. This maturity continuum. And I believe, I believe that Joel was not talking about age groups. He was talking about maturity levels. Why do I know that? Because when I was young, I had visions. And when I was young, I had dreams. And when I'm old, I'm having visions and having dreams. And I believe that, that if it's to be taken literally, then only sons and daughters would prophesy, only young men would have visions, and only old men would dream dreams, and only slaves would have prophesy as well. But I believe that the slaves, as, the, as it is in Scripture, is the Greek word doulos, which literally means bondservants of God, those who have had their ear pierced permanently, and their life is no longer their own, they're the Lord's. It's the word that's used for the prophets in the Bible and the apostles in Scripture. So I think we have to work, work through that particular issue. There are, let's continue on. There's challenges that we have to face. If you're in a revelatory gift or any type of gifting, evangelist, teacher, pastor, apostolic, it doesn't make a difference. The church is changing. The methodology is, is changing today. There's three theological perspectives that are, that are really intense. The issue of, of theology, again, we've talked about this, but on the part of the prophetic, there's a lack of theological understanding, and on the part of the church, there's theological conflicts that we're expected to fall into, into, or expected to fall into a camp or another. For example, there's two major theologies out there today. One is basically Calvinism, and the other one's Arminianism. Calvinism says, God does everything, totally sovereign, you don't have to do anything. Arminianism says, you got to do everything. Work out your salvation daily with fear and trembling. Man, you may not even be saved. Every time there's an altar call, you better be down there just in case he comes tonight. <laughs> and I mean, that by the time I was 12 years old, I'd been saved 40 times. <laughs> because I had to go to the altar and make sure. So we have to walk into that. We have to understand that, that you're going to be speaking, if you have that level of gifting and that level of maturity, you're going to be speaking in a church tonight that has Calvinistic theology, and tomorrow morning you're going to be speaking in a church that has Armenian theology. And you've got to know how to say things from God in such a way that both camps believe it. It's not that easy to do. Pastors call you in and say, brother, do you realize what you said indicated that we have a responsibility to keep ourselves clean? Don't you know that none of us can do that? It is only by the blood of Jesus that that happened? I said, yeah, but that isn't what God said. And then the next morning you're called in. I said, brother, don't you understand that we have to work every day to make sure that we're clean. And your word indicated that God would take care of that. I said, yeah, but that's what God said. There has to be a way of communicating it. 
I love what a friend of mine, David Pitches, said. David Pitches said they're both right and God been it that way. Why? To keep us from thinking we know it all. You do daily inspect yourself and God's blood is, no one could do it but Jesus. It is true. And God does keep it in what I call divine, dynamic, spiritual tension. And he meant it that way. Well, there's, you know, the issue of other prophet, historical prophetic problems, true yesterday, true today, that still plagues the church. We have to deal with that. We have to deal with, with how other churches perceive prophetic voices in other camps. And that in, influences because you can be in the ecstatic camp and having dreams and visions and visitations, and some of the Nambi camps said that is absolutely ludicrous. That doesn't happen anymore. And then other people, you can be in the Nabi camp, and those of those in the in the, the the camp over here, the ecstatic camp says, oh, that's just machine gun prophecy. It's not really of any value. And both are wrong. They're both of value. And they both have accesses. Excesses. Then we continue on in this whole changing dynamic, there's a loss of what I call kingdom now theology. Now I mean, don't mean the kingdom now has in a historical sense, I mean in literally in the issue of Jesus saying, the kingdom of God lies within you. And it's the Father's good pleasure to give you that kingdom. That's the type of kingdom I'm talking about. And we have to, we have to work through all those things. We have to understand that there is a place for the here now and what, what John Wimber called the here now and the not yet of the kingdom. We have to understand the dynamics of that. We espouse a, a theological or eschatological justification for the lack of the Holy Spirit's presence. Eschatological meaning that, that we're in the wrong time frame for the Holy Spirit to be poured out. He was poured out once, but he's not poured out anymore. He didn't need to be poured out because the church didn't have any more problems. They had problems in the early days, and that's why the Holy Spirit was poured out like it was, but we don't have those kind of problems today. I, I wish, I wish, you know, some, there's been, I don't remember, there's been some programs put on or some thought put into, like guys who can put on glasses and you can see the demonic world. I wish I had a pair of those glasses. And then the pastors who said, there's no demons. <laughs> Here, <laughs> put those on. And so what happens is this, here's what I found out. When you, have a, when you have a loss of power, you switch to programs. Programs, I'm, they're, they're not bad, programs are not bad, but programs should be the result of a move of God versus something we think can entice people to come until there's a move of God. Oh Lord, I know this is gonna, really irritate some people. And I believe that the rush to gain numbers has, ca has caused less of a cry for holiness and resulted in spiritual mediocrity. I believe that the church by and large has chosen respectability over anointing. I believe that there's a lack of awareness or even a, even a lack of belief in the reality of spiritual warfare that's going on. I believe that there's a tendency to think in terms of sin management in pastoral staffs versus biblical mandates. I believe that there's a trend to view people as psychological rather than spiritual beings, and therefore we develop our church services and our sermons around the psychological or sociological approaches. I believe that the church by and large has lost the awe of God and the hope that God might do something in their midst today. And that is sad. I think if God, if we really believe what God is doing, we'd come to church with crash helmets on.
I believe that the church by and large has forgotten the biblical mandate that it must be the change agent of the world and that we are sent here to be the representation of the Lord Jesus Christ as his body and as such we need to manifest everything that he had in every single meeting that we have and the result should be a changed world. And I believe that the reason we're not seen is because we don't believe that we're to change other people. We're to believe that we come to church simply to be fed, not to have an outgrowth of that feeding as a physical exercise or spiritual exercise that changes other people's lives. I hear people talking more with more passion about the diet they're on than the presence of God in their church. I believe that we have forgotten that what Jesus did in his death, burial, and resurrection and ascension to the right hand of the Father, thinking of himself as, as, as making of himself no reputation, totally dependent on God, coming fully as man, can do nothing except the Father gives it to him. I believe that we've forgotten that what he did was transformational and that he is here to transform our lives. And I believe that we have gotten to a place where we, where we see current psychological motives as being, as being deterministic, saying that it's because of somebody did this in my bloodline, that's why I'm like I am, and I can't help it. And that totally leaves out the transforming power of the blood of Jesus. And therefore, we inadvertently perceive Satan as irrelevant or worse, more powerful than the church. It so bothers me when I hear pastors say, and I've had them say it, God would not do something like that. And it was powerful. As if, as if Satan, either, either Satan is more powerful than God when you make that statement, or God allows Satan to do things that he himself won't do, therefore giving Satan the upper hand. And so now we as pastors seek and read more books on management tools than we seek the presence of the Holy Spirit. We look for the latest fad more than the power of God for church growth and kingdom expansion. Two modern day methodological challenges I believe that the church are facing is one is postmodernism where there's a lack of absolutes. And listen, anytime you start talking about an a, a lack of absolutes, then eventually there has to be no God who is absolute. Therefore, there can't be a God because there are no absolutes. And therefore, there's many ways to God because there can't be absolutely one way. Risk, the move of the Holy Spirit in, in their services is bad because it might offend someone. Tell that to the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. It might offend someone in Jerusalem, so I can't move. I don't think the Holy Spirit cares about offending. I think he cares a whole lot about wooing and drawing because no one comes to the Father except the Holy Spirit draws him. And so there is a growing in the postmodern communities, there's a growing psychological necessity for profiles based on demographic information. On the other hand, there's a seeker sensitive model. I think the seeker sensitive model can be an incredible fishnet. It gathers a whole lot of fish, but somebody's got to clean them, else they begin to stink. The basic idea in the seeker sensitive model is if you love God, everything is going to be okay. But sometimes I wonder which God, because in some cases, God is not, who is God is not really clear. And I know that there's some great seeker sensitive churches that do give that definition, but by and large, the entire seeker sensitive community does not. And so there's a, an, a fear of offending the non-believer with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Again, risk in church is bad. And the seeker sensitive prof model depends on sociological profiles. Postmodern depends on psychological profiles. S 
Seeker-sensitive depends on sociological profiles. Well, in the midst of all that, is there any hope for the prophetic? <laughs> and I'm absolutely convinced there's more hope than ever. But it's going to take a whole reformation of the mindsets of revelatory gifted people. But I think it's also going to take a, a whole reformation of apostolic mindsets because I don't think, I think there's very few people on the face of the earth who have a grip on apostolic ministry. And I think we'll get a better grip as each of the ministries, each of the gifts in Ephesians 4 come into a more mature understanding. It will further clarify the apostolic understanding. I, I believe that. I think we have to have what I call prophetic reformation in order for, the, for it to, be, to, be, to make it. We have to change how prophetic people view themselves in the church, and we have to change how the church views prophetic people. We have to understand what the church is all about. I believe that we have to take it outside the church walls. I believe that if we don't take it outside the church walls, what ends up happening, and I've seen this over and over again, it seems as if that whenever prophetic people get kept inside the walls of the church, something happens that I can only liken to spiritual incest. Inbreeding amongst revelatory people, meaning the inbreeding of revelation, what does that do? Inbreeding creates mutants, deformities. And so what we end up happening when revelatory people don't get outside the church walls, we end up having mutant prophetic utterances that have really no form to the original prophetic utterance God gave. I believe that by taking it outside the walls, we keep our DNA gene pool healthy. By taking it outside the church walls, we end up coming to a place where that the, the people out there mean more than our revelation does. Yes, Lord. Yes. And, then, and, and unless you love others more than your gift, you are zero. First Corinthians 13, two, though I have the gift of prophecy, can move mountains from here to there, all manner of faith, can tell you every secret of your heart, I am nothing unless I have love. And love says I love them more than my gift. What happens in, in closed environments, you end up having the mutants come, mutant prophecies come forth and it proves you love your gift more than you love the people. Only by getting outside the church walls do you prove you love the people more than you love your gift. I believe that there has to be prophetic small groups that have a, almost a mandate from God to go out and do. I believe that we need neighborhood outreaches and homes and that with those neighborhood outreaches, we pass out flyers amongst the neighborhood and we say, come to this, bring your own food. We're gonna have, we're gonna have uh, dream interpretations, free dream interpretations for the entire neighborhood. Some experts in dream interpretation is coming from an ancient Hebraic model that has been passed down for millennia. <laughs> and see how many of your neighbors come. There'll probably be four or five at first, and then they hear what you give them, and next time there's going to be 10 or 12, the next time 30. Why? Because it will no longer be limited to your neighborhood because they will tell their friends in other parts of the city. I think we are missing an incredible prophetic tool, uh, event, uh, sorry, I believe we're missing an incredible tool of prophetic evangelism where we neglect prophecy, telling the secrets of the heart, and thus they bow down and say, surely God is in your midst. When you, do, when you neglect dream interpretation, because if the interpretation of a dream can bring Nebuchadnezzar to the Lord, it can bring your neighbor to the Lord. We set up, we, we, here, here, those of you that are from New England are fairly familiar with this thing called Haunted Happenings. We set up tents for Haunted Happenings here in the, uh, in the Salem area. About 45 minutes from here, most of those of you from outside, it's about northeast of here, about 30, maybe 30 minutes. <clears throat> and in that, this two week period, over 400,000 people come through that town. We set up this tents in, the, in conjunction with a, a four square church. We set up three tables. One said, free dream interpretations. Next table said, free spiritual readings. 
Next table said, free encouraging words. Now you're probably thinking, who in the world would go get an encouraging word? Everybody. Everybody. Every table had 20 to 30 people in line. So we doubled the number of tables. Two tables of free encouraging words. Two tables of spiritual readings, which is prophecy. Two tables of dream interpretation. And still had lines out the tent waiting to get the accuracy was so phenomenal. They went and told the psychic friends who were doing the psychic readings, come over here and get an accurate one. We go to new age environments. We set up, we set up uh, uh, tables in the new age environments and the Kabbalah send us the people to get their dreams interpreted. We do a better job than they do. In fact, it's not unusual for everybody around us to lose their ability to read people. I love that. I don't feel the least bit sorry for them. I have compassion under sin, but not, not on their gift. I believe that we're, we have to see a reformation of how this gift is used. I believe we have to have imagination, holy imagination from God. I believe that he will give us ideas and ways that we can penetrate the realm of darkness and light will always overcome darkness but I believe that we have to get out of our boredom. Here's what I've noticed when there's church is boring. Now, I'm sure that no one in here has ever been to a boring church, <laughs> but your friends have probably told you about churches they've been to that are boring. And here's what I noticed about boring churches. Creativity stops. Imagination stops. Art stops, music stops, everything stops. The boredom is like terminal. <laughs> and so you borrow everything from everybody else because there's nothing fresh coming from your midst. I believe that as we start breaking the boundaries we're going to see incredible creativity. But as I said the other night, or was it, when did I say, this morning. My time does blend together. It wasn't, no, I didn't say that last night, did I? I had a limited vocabulary last night. I, that's just the way it was. <laughs> but in order to get something we've never gotten, we have to get past the boundaries that we failed to get past. Boredom is simply boundaries you failed to get past. And what happens is the, it begins to putrefy and then begins to petrify and pretty soon there's no life in the church. At least putrefied as bacteria. Petrified doesn't even have that. <laughs> Finally, I just say this. I believe God is looking for prophetic people who exercise the Beatitudes as a lifestyle. Read them. You want the kingdom of heaven? Who get it? Blessed are the for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You want mercy? Who gets it? You want to know God? Who gets it? You want to see God? Who gets it? You see, everything you want to have happen to you in a revelatory experience is contained in those little beatitudes. If you would live a life commensurate with the lifestyle that it talks about there, you wouldn't have any problem with revelation at all. 
at all. It would be pouring out of you. What keeps us from, from living that type of lifestyle and from really paying the price that it would take to live in the, a lifestyle of the Beatitudes is because we've lost hope that God might come in our midst. If God comes in our midst, people study all the time. Oh my goodness. Bible schools start because God comes into the midst. Colleges, universities have started because God comes into the midst. That's exactly why Harvard was started, exactly why Yale was started, exactly why Princeton was started, exactly why Dartmouth was started, because there was a move of God and said, let's, let's, let's study the word and let's teach everybody else about it. Let's take this all over the world. When the presence of God comes, all the boredom goes. Well, how many of you have ever done what David did? Not danced, although some of you Obviously, you haven't. <laughs> but I'm talking about how many of you have ever stirred yourself up like David did? See, the Bible says that he looked for someone. He looked for one who would stir himself up like David did and found none. You see, what does it mean, stirred himself up? It literally means this, I know God, I know who he is, and though right now I do not feel like worshiping him, I will worship him. I will move. David didn't say, Miriam, I did this because God moved on me and I couldn't help it. But he danced. He said, I danced with all my might. I did it. How many of us are waiting for God to touch us in such a way that we have to do something instead of stirring ourselves up like David did? I believe we will never see revival until we start stirring ourselves up in God. Why? Because we will stay in our comfort zone. And we will, in our comfort zone, you will never do anything that is beyond your comfort. And if you never do anything that's beyond your comfort, guess what? You never get beyond your boundaries. If you never get beyond your boundaries, you will never experience something you've never experienced. By definition, impossible. I know I sound like I'm being hard tonight. I'm actually telling you this because I have great hope. And it's because I have great hope and great expectancy and I know something's going to happen. I'm telling you, this is what will keep you from getting it because I'm going to get it. You can watch me get it. And you'll go, boy, I wish I had it. Or you can stir yourself up and you can get it. Well, that was not in my, not, hardly this was in my notes. Make sure you write all that down and fill in the blanks.